Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Children's Hospital receives some national recognition from a study by U.S. News and World Report. And we'll hear from the author of a new book on the history of the Bill of Rights. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Phoenix Children's Hospital is prominently noted in U.S. News and World Report's latest national rankings of children's medical institutions. Joining us now is Bob Meyer, Phoenix Children's Hospital's president and CEO. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, congratulations on this. Now, this is a national list of best children's hospitals. Yeah, I mean, it's put together every year. It's, uh, there's 184 hospitals that are asked to submit data, uh, patient pop or volumes, et cetera, that could be used to analyze where you rank on a relative basis. Uh, so we were just uh, very pleased that we're ranked in, uh, there's 10 uh, specialties that they rank. We're in the top 50 and nine out of those 10 specialties. I was gonna ask how this survey does go about uh, ranking hospital uh, clinical outcomes, survival rates, those things gotta be big. Yeah, quality indicators, out, uh, outcomes, a variety of things, some reputational score. And in fact, one of the reasons why I think younger hospitals like Phoenix Children's are moving up in the rankings is there's less reputation, more factual based outcomes, uh, which is very beneficial for hospitals that are younger. And we should mention that uh, U.S. News and World Report does this mostly for their readers to know where to go or what to look at, correct? Yes, it's very similar to colleges and they do a lot of rankings of this mm -hmm. nature, but it is to tell people, uh, consumers, uh, based on the subjective data, et cetera, where would be the best places to go in your localities or regions, uh, et cetera. So yes, that's exactly what they put it together for. And, and we mentioned clinical outcomes and those sorts of things. I saw that efficiency and coordination of care delivery was also prominent. Yeah, I mean, that's all part of the big picture now is uh, taking care of children in a holistic uh, manner because many of our patients have chronic illnesses. So we see them for long periods of time. And so again, uh, all of the above is what they evaluate. And including uh, resources like nurse staffing, things like that? Oh, nurse staffing, your programmatic development, what type of imaging equipment you have. Uh, it is very, very comprehensive on the objective side of what they're looking for. And as for reputation, who is exactly asked about that? Who, whose opinion counts there when they talk about a, a children's hospital's reputation? Uh, actually, they send out a survey to our peers. And when I say our peers, about 5,000 uh, pediatricians and pediatric specialists around the country who are asked to rank uh, the various children's hospitals. And it's so it's a little bit subjective, um, but again, a pretty accurate, we think, assessment from a reputational score. And that, you mentioned that the younger hospitals are, are moving up because of their rep reputation is big as far as children's health, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is very big. And that's why the, the if you look at the very top ones, there are the Eastern, Children's Hospitals have been around for 150, 200 years, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, et cetera. But again, that reliance, uh, the survey, if you go way back when, it was 50% reputational, 50% mm. objective. It's now about 85, 15, uh, so it's much more objective today. And Phoenix Children's Hospital ranking nine in the, of the uh, top 10 categories, was ranked uh, in nine of the top 10. Uh, neurology, neurosurgery, 14th, cancer, 16th, these sorts of things. Talk to us about advancements out there and uh, how you look on improving those rankings. Well, I think it's uh, continually improving your programs. We're very focused and the, we have four that are, uh, programs that are in the top 20 in the country. Uh, and they're very focused. They're what we call our centers of excellence. We put a lot of emphasis on them, recruiting physicians, technology. Um, so it's a lot of leading edge things that have been acquired. But again, we've recruited very heavily from around the country uh, to bring in top specialists. This is the fourth largest children's uh, market in the country. And so we should have a children's hospital that's comparable to those other cities. Uh, that's what we've been trying to build. And we should mention, along with neurosurgery and cancer, uh, cardiology and heart surgery, 16th, nephrology, 17th. Uh, not bad. No. Yeah. How do you improve those again? Well, we continue to add to those programs. I think uh, adding more physicians, but more specialization. Uh, a good example is there's some very specific imaging equipment we're looking at for orthopedics, as an example, uh, which uses no radiation. 
Mm. Uh, so if we were to acquire that technology, again, it increases our scores, et cetera, and potentially our rankings. And as far as, as, as children's health and at the, at the Phoenix Children's Hospital, talk to us about what you guys have been doing now in the past, advancements that have been made, and what you're looking for now in the future. Well, I think a lot of the advancements have been in uh, technology. So for example, we just uh, uh, announced a, a large genomic uh, joint venture with uh, Nant Health. Uh, we believe that's sort of the future of medicine, so to speak, and we'll cross all of these service lines, all these programs that we're talking about. So we're recruiting uh, physicians with genomic background in neurology, in cancer, uh, in heart, et cetera. Uh, so uh, look at it very simply, it's a genomic service line. So again, it will be a major enhancement to those programs. And as far as what, what Phoenix Children's Hospital takes from the survey, you look over something like this, you see the numbers, you gotta be pleased, what do you take from it? Well, I think it shows very clearly because the U.S. News and World Report has also given us analytics that tell us, you know, where we didn't get points, where 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 we rank against the people in front of us, so to speak. <clears throat> and so those are decisions we need to make as to whether or not we're willing to make those kinds of investments. And going back to my example, that piece of imaging technology, uh, no radiation is a big deal. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it, you got a children's hospital, and some folks will say, what's the difference now between going to a children's hospital, a specific children's institution, pediatrics, and going to a mainline hospital that deals in pediatrics? Well, I think the biggest difference is everybody that's at a children's hospital is there specifically to take care of children. Uh, the technology is adapted to children, et cetera. They're not just small adults. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the actual technology is different. But more than anything, it's the people that are involved. I mean, they're there for one reason, is which is take care of children. But we also see it in volunteers. We see it in uh, our uh, donors, et cetera. There's just a tremendous amount of interest in it. Uh, so again, uh, when you look at our centers of excellence, are completely pediatric uh, focused. As for, and we've heard in the past that Arizona in particular, but around the country, there's a shortage of doctors, there's a shortage of, of specialists, mm -hmm. these sorts of, are you seeing that in pediatrics as well? Yeah, very much so. In fact, one of the things we do, we, we actually do three things. We do clinical care, education, and research. So you hit on our educational pitch. <clears throat> so uh, several years ago, there were only three pediatric fellowships in Arizona, which are the, the how you create pediatric specialists. Uh, so our two have now become 14. And so when you get into what differentiates a children's hospital, we're uh, now educating specialists in 14 different specialties, and we actually have three more fellowship programs on the uh, uh, approval process. So again, it's a highly differentiated is uh, how you get these physicians, because if you don't do fellowships, you have to continually root, recruit from out of state. Right. And that's a very, very cumbersome way to go about it. It may be a cumbersome way, but when you wind up on the U.S. News and World Report rankings, it makes it a little easier, I would imagine. Well, yeah, but the reason you can do the fellowships is you're bringing in people yeah, yeah. that can do some of this teaching and, some, and attract some of these people as well. The hard one, and I've said this a lot, the, 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 the hardest recruit is the first big name. Mm -hmm. After that, they start to come because you've got the big name and more people want to be associated with them. And we've seen that in cancer. We've seen it in uh, neurosciences. Uh, very clearly in the heart program. We've got a lot of people coming here for to work with the people that are here. Well, it sounds like things are going very well. Phoenix Children's Hospital, congratulations on their rankings, and I gotta think they're gonna improve even more next year. Well, we hope so, and uh, you know, we know where we, we, we can get some of those points, so to speak, so yeah. I think we'll see them improve, yeah. Well, congratulations, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. <laughs>
The ferry operated for 52 more years, transporting thousands of hikers, horses, wagons, and even small automobiles across the river. Only the railroad, and finally in 1929, the Navajo Bridge made Lee's Ferry obsolete. Today, the original Navajo Bridge is reserved for pedestrians, while the new Navajo Bridge, built beside it in 1995, caters to cars and trucks. While the ferry itself is long gone, the name remains. Lee's Ferry is now the terminus for thousands of awestruck sightseers rafting on the mighty Colorado River. Local attorney Robert McWhorter has written a new book on the history of the Bill of Rights. The book is titled Bills, Quills, and Stills and is subtitled An Annotated, Illustrated, and Illuminated History of the Bill of Rights. The book certainly is all of those things and more. Here now is Robert McWhorter. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, congratulations on this book. I mean, it's, just, it's one of those things where you pick it up and you just wind up going through it and going through it. Um, does the world need another book on the Bill of Rights? Absolutely, especially mine. <laughs> uh, why? Why'd you write this? Thing? Why do you think we need this? You know, the amount of uh, kind of civic education in the schools is much less than it was. And what I wanted to try to do is write a book that dealt with these issues, dealt with the, the fundamentals of our country. I mean, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are the owner's manual of the country. And I wanted to do that in a way that tied in modern cultural references to show this stuff is relevant. This is important today. And I should mention that uh, you can't really see too much of this is a very, it is illustrated and yeah. it is annotated. Sometimes there's, there are more footnotes than there are is text and there are pictures abundantly uh, illustrated on every single, why'd you go that route? Because I wanted to display it. I wanted to try to do something new. Look, anybody can find a dusty old tome on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And, and you know, I have plenty of footnotes in there for people who like dusty old tomes, it is there. But for people who like to just see references and, and visuals and how it ties in, that's what I wanted to try to do and make it relevant and interesting. And to keep it from being boring. Keep it from being boring. Because we got enough key. textbooks out there on the Bill of Rights and the Constitution to, to where that uh, is probably uh, safely yeah. achieved. Um, there, you, you write that there are many incorrect notions about the Bill of Rights. What does that mean? Well, a lot of people have all these notions like, oh, it's in the Bill of Rights and my constitutional rights. Well, you know, the Bill of Rights deal with certain specific things. Uh, they didn't really even apply much to normal people for the first hundred years of the Republic. It took the Civil War amendments to give them kind of scope and breadth that we think of today. Uh, the right to free speech is only the first part of the, of the 20th century where you had the free speech cases applying the First Amendment to our daily lives. So these things have kind of grown over time, and that's what's important. And that's where, again, the cultural references come in. Uh, what does freedom of the press mean? What does it mean for a modern movie today? All of that is why I tried to do that. And we should mention you also go into the prehistory there of the Bill of Rights and, and noted that many of the framers of the Constitution didn't think a Bill of Rights was necessary. No, no. They thought that Bill of Rights would be redundant. In other words, their point was, look, we provided for a Republican form of government. If you want a right, you can guarantee that your congressman will make sure you get your rights or your senator or, 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 or the House of Representatives, right? Uh, the president's elected. It's not like we have a king. So in every way, we already have a Bill of Rights just by the structure of the Constitution. That argument that they made with great sincerity proved to be totally wrong. Madison, when he first made it, was wrong. Hamilton, was, when he first made it, they both made that argument in the Federalist Papers. They were just wrong. Nobody liked it. They wanted a Bill of Rights. They wanted a written guarantee of certain things, and that's where you get the Bill of Rights. And we should mention that Patrick Henry was key in this whole situation, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. See, Patrick Henry didn't really like Madison. And Patrick Henry had kept Madison being from one of the two senators from Virginia because at that period of time, uh, it was the... Uh, legislatures that chose United States senators. Mm -hmm. So he, he kept Madison become, from becoming a senator. So Madison was stuck trying to win a house in the, in the House of Representatives. And Henry kind of gerrymandered him into the same district against another future president, James Monroe, who was kind of George Washington's aide de camp during the Revolutionary War. So Madison was fighting for, this political, for his political life. And Patrick Henry, by the way, most people don't know, was an anti-federalist. He didn't like the federal constitution. So Madison had to do th two things. He had to defend the constitution that he basically wrote, and he had to get reelected, uh, or elected for the first time to, to Congress. So his idea was, hey, forget what I said in the Federalist Papers. <laughs> just, just ignore that. I'm going to be the champion for a Bill of Rights. And he was, and 
unlike a lot of politicians, you've got to say this, he lived up to his campaign promise. Yes, yes, he did. Even if he changed his mind, he changed his mind and didn't have a problem with it, which is not, you know, politicians can do that. All right, um, what is a right? What is a right? Well, okay. <laughs> How far back do you want to go? If you went to ancient Rome, your right was dependent. What a right was, was what, was what being a Roman citizen gave you. Now, if you didn't happen to be a Roman citizen and you were a slave, too bad for you. If you were in ancient Greece, your right was what your police gave you, your, your city-state. Okay. Well, you get these radical notions coming on from John Locke that a right is what you have inherent to you as a being. It is in a, unalienable. You, in other words, you can't alienate it from you. You can't take it away. God-given. God-given, although God-given or by some notion of social contract. Right. Some thought of God-given, but if you notice, Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration, didn't say, we get these from God. It is from nature's God, providential things. Sure. Okay, so you get a little, little tension yeah, yeah, there, yeah. right? So a right is what's inherent to you. Now, the trouble with these rights in the state of nature is if you try to exercise them, big guys beat you up. Okay, so the state of nature is not secure for your rights. So we need to have government and we need to have society to give us what we inherently have. Now, why is that important? That's what we argue about today. No, don't do that because it's my right. It's my right to do this, right to bear arms, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we still live in government and every right is subject to limitation. I mean, I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist, but there are certain things I just can't say. Now, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous dicta was, you can't go into a crowded movie theater and falsely yell fire. You can yell fire if there really is a fire, but you can't do it falsely and not expect to be prosecuted criminally. Okay, that is a First Amendment limit. Um, you and I can't agree to have a conspiracy to rob a bank. We don't have a First Amendment right to have that conversation and not get prosecuted for it. Okay, so even the First Amendment, there's limits, and all rights have duties and responsibilities as well as benefits. And with that in mind, as we continue moving uh, toward the Bill of Rights and how it was founded, the, the, the role of slavery in the formation of the Bill of Rights. Talk to us about that. It was huge. It was huge. Uh, let's do just two amendments. The Second Amendment. Um, many of the southern states' concerns about maintain, make, maintaining the right to bear arms was so that they could have patrols to guard against insurrection from slaves. That was specifically what they were worried about. They often did not send arms or men to the Revolution, Continental Ar Army because they wanted to make sure they had their slave patrols intact to guard against insurrection. So that was clear. Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment protects you from unreasonable search and seizures. Okay, so the government can't come in and looking for contraband. Now the contraband usually today are drugs, cocaine, heroin, whatever, right? The contraband of that time was molasses. And the molasses was in New England. It was converted to rum. The rum was taken to the coast of Africa. 110 gallons could buy you a human being, which is about, oh, $2,900 in U.S. dollars today. That human being was brought over. He was sent to the southern United States where he grew sugar to make more molasses, which went back up to New England to be converted to rum. It was the triangle trade. Yes. Cutting Great Britain out of the trade, right. which was pissing Great Britain off. <laughs> so the entire reason we have that Fourth Amendment is to protect from unreasonable searches and seizures because the British government had what was called a general search warrant, writs of assistance, to go break into your house to look for contraband molasses. They could look in your trunks, your warehouse, everywhere to look for contraband molasses without specificity or particularity, which is what the Fourth Amendment today requires. And uh, obviously slavery involved there. Also, I guess that explains bills, quills, and stills, stills. the title of your book. Prodigious amounts of alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> they all do. And, and by the way, alcohol at a different place. I mean, they liked alcohol the same reason we do. But, you know, let's say you had an ache and pain. Well, you couldn't pop a Tylenol in 1791. You probably drank some beer. Or let's say you wanted some vitamin C in the morning in the middle of the winter in Massachusetts. Well, no, you drank a pint of high, hard cider because that's where you got your vitamin C. So they drank a lot more alcohol than we do. Let's put it that way. You, you write that every right has a purpose and every right has a history. Explain. Yeah. Well, you trace everything back. Now, when we say, oh, you know, my, my rights, a lot of what we mean are actually after the Bill of Rights was written. For instance, uh, right to universal education. Uh, the framers never provided for that. We have done that. We have grown and expanded. So with various purposes that have grown up over time, we have provided this sense of rights and we have expanded that sense of rights. 
Now, the big debate today, for instance, is the right to universal health care. The framers never thought of that. Most industrialized nations realize they need that, and we are trying to respond, and we are arguing about it as vehemently today as the framers did about various rights that they wrote down in the well, And it, it wasn't the Ninth Amendment kind of the forgotten amendment that kind yeah. of includes this idea of things that weren't included? Talk to us about the Ninth Amendment. Well, Justice Robert Jackson said, I was trying to think about what those rights were in the Ninth Amendment, and I'm sorry, I just can't think of one right <laughs> offhand. Um, that's not his exact words, but, right. but, but this mystery, there's still a mystery to me, is what he said. Yes. And uh, Robert Bork said, oh, it, the Ninth Amendment's kind of an ink blot. In other words, they didn't write it down. Well, the Ninth Amendment are all these things like rights that aren't retained. It, it's a concept of natural law. In other words, we've written down certain rights in the Bill of Rights, but all those other rights you still have. In other words, the government doesn't get them. So the Ninth Amendment was intended as kind of a catch-all to make sure it said that all of your rights that you have unalienable to you, you still get, even though we wrote down the Bill of Rights. Right. See, some of the early arguments against putting a Bill of Rights, and Hamilton advanced this, is look, you can't write these things down because if you write them down, it's going to assume the government gets all the rest that you don't write. And we can't write every right down. Well, the Ninth Amendment was the answer to Hamilton's argument that was in the Federalist Papers. Which moves us then to the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment. And that is now, a, a Tenth Amendment, it's, it's amazing. You go for decades without hearing about the Tenth Amendment. All of a sudden, you're hearing a lot about yeah. the Tenth Amendment. In the Supreme Court, in the case versus Bond, the United States versus Bond, it's in play after 100 and, or 210 years. It's, it's all of a sudden the Tenth Amendment's in play. The Tenth Amendment is more about states' rights and the states' rights' arguments. Um, but the interesting thing about the Tenth Amendment, it says all the rights that are not specified for the federal government go to the states or to the people. Well, over time, we have read or to the people as more important than to the states. Mm -hmm. In other words, the federal government, we contract individually with the federal government. See, we're Arizonans, right? But it's not us as Arizonans getting our rights from the federal government. It's us as individuals. See, we can cut Arizona out of the equation and say, hey, state of Arizona, you can't do this because you're violating my First Amendment rights. We usually don't look to the Arizona Constitution right. on that. Right. And that's what the Tenth Amendment, which was originally intended more to protect states' rights, has evolved over time to be an individual right. So we, we've got these Ten Amendments here, and, and you've, obviously it's a big book, lots of photos, lots of drawings, lots of pictures, annotation just everywhere. Um, how do, you, how do you focus all of this into making sure each amendment gets its proper uh, perspective, historical narrative? How, how, do you, how, do you, how long did this take? Oh, eight to ten years. With difficulty is how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot of time to mull it over. I'll tell you, one of the, the hardest things, the hardest chapter by far was the last chapter I wrote, which was the First Amendment chapter. Yeah. Because in the First Amendment, if you take almost any issue of the culture wars today, it involves the First Amendment, freedom of religion, free exercise of religion, uh, freedom from being established. In other words, I want to freely exercise my religion, but I need to be free from you establishing your religion over me. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, everything is there. And, and that was difficult. Do you deal with it as two separate amendments, or do you deal with it as one? And I took a leap of faith, and what I came up with was what they were arguing they wanted the right to speak about was religion. In other words, they were intricately involved. Mm. Now. I personally am not a proponent of this idea that we, they created a Christian nation. I just don't believe that's what they intended to do. But the basis of the right to speak, what they wanted to speak about was their creed. And what their creed were was whatever, whatever creed they have when they came here. And, and that's what the First Amendment grew out of. What kind of reaction are you getting so far from the book? So far it's been positive. Uh, we'll see. Um, there's stuff in here, uh, for instance, I've, I've, on the Second Amendment chapter. I've had people that are vehement individual right gun advocates that like the chapter, and I've had people that are believe in serious gun control, and they like the chapter. I tried to be as balanced as I could with the history. I mean, there is a historical argument to support an individual rights notion of the Second Amendment and a, a kind of a collectivist right, so it's all part of the militia. And you can take history, and there's enough history there to support either argument. And I tried to be as fair as possible on each one as I go through. Now, that being said, when I hear different arguments about the Constitution, when I argue about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, there are arguments that I disagree with but I think are valid arguments with which I simply disagree. And then there's arguments that are simply not valid. 
they don't historically work. They, right. th there's no historical support. And I try to, as politely as I can, draw that distinction. Well, you, you did a great job. I, I, I highly recommend it on this because it's, an, it's, it's I hate to say it, but it's kind of an easy read. It's certainly easy on the eyes, and it's a, it's a job well done. Congratulations Thank on Thank you this. very much. Thank you for being here. Good, good. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, Department of Child Safety Director Greg McKay will join us in studio to discuss his vision for the office as well as recent high-profile child abuse cases. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.